Welcome back to another video this is a part 1 of, what if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart, I don't really wanna drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 1, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 1, but he is Rias's cool aide. Scene, Kuo Academy, Kuo Japan. Looking from a large balcony from the second floor of this large and elaborate school was Sauna Shitori. Her beautiful violet eyes were focusing on something in the distance. Slowly removing her pink glasses while softly cleaning them with her sleeve, the girl moves a bit of her short and black hair from her pale face. At further glance, we notice that Sauna is a petite yet gorgeous female as she sports a very cute bob cut along with perfect qualities such as unblemished skin and perfect teeth. One might assume that this girl was a model or idol perhaps. Well, this was sort of the case as Sona was considered the third most popular girl in the entire high school. This was due to not only her beauty, but also her status as the student council president among other things that the average student wouldn't know about. There was also the fact that Sauna Shitori wasn't actually a real person, no, Sauna was simply an alias. Not only that, but Sauna wasn't even human. Her real name is Sona and she is a devil. Next in line to take over the high class house of Citri, Sona is for better or worse, a princess. She wasn't the only devil or rather, devil princess in the school either. Nope, for there was another red-headed devil. She was currently walking next to the person who had Sona's interest. As she continued to watch the pair from her position, the violet-eyed devil changed her usual stoic demeanor to that of concern as her eyebrows lifted ever so slightly. We begin to pan out to the large courtyard that separates the main school from the main fence. We notice a small group of students, all of which seem to be surrounding a tall and voluptuous red-headed woman. This was none other than Rias Grimori. Unlike her counterpart, Rias chose not to have an alias, rather, she chooses to be more casual in her ways of dealing with things involving the supernatural. This was something Sona always found very frustrating when it came to her best and childhood friend. Oh yes, Rias and Sona are very close, though from an onlooker's point of view, both girls seem to be polar opposites when it comes to personality. There were five individuals who were hanging around Rias. Akino Himahima, who was the second most popular girl in Kuo, was speaking with Yudo Kiba, considered the prince of Kuo. They looked to be in agreement about something as the two were smiling. There were also Kaniko Tuju, the official mascot of Kuo, and Asi Argento, the foreign exchange Italian dream girl, as the two looked to be engaged in their own conversations. Asia had a warm smile as Kanoko maintained her usual stoic and emotionless features. Then there was finally the person who had Sona's full and undivided attention. He currently has his right arm wrapped in both of Rias's while blushing madly. The blushing boy was the infamous Hyodo Issei. Sona had dealt with Issei many times in the past, on a disciplinary level that is, Time and time again, Issei and his delinquent friends, Matsuda and Motohama, were always getting caught for doing lewd things such as peeping on the kendo girls in the locker rooms. Naturally, being the student council president, Sona was in charge of handling delinquent behavior via detention or other means. As Sona continued to stare aimlessly, the sounds of the main door, opening and shutting, got the violet-eyed girl's attention. Turning around and walking back into the room, Sona was greeted by the vice president of the student council, Subaki Shinra. Good morning, president, Subaki, who was much taller than Sona, adjusted her own glasses and politely bowed. Returning the bow, Sona, showed a slight smile. Good morning Subaki, say, this is going to sound a bit strange, especially coming from me, but at this point, I suppose I should say something. Tilting her head a bit, Subaki replies, of course, President, what is it? Sona sits down at her large desk and slopes back in her chair. Subaki, either I am going completely insane or I think I am falling for that idiot Hyodo. Blinking a few times, Subaki paced back and forth, not quite understanding what her king had just said. She then stopped while looking back at Sona. Adjusting her glasses, Subaki needed to make sure she heard what she heard. Um, President, can you please repeat what you said? I fear I may be going deaf perhaps. Sona facepalmed and very quietly, repeated what she had said. Issei Hyodo, I, I, I think I, I think I'm falling for him. Subaki nods while looking for a chair to sit in. She looked to be having some sort of a dizzy spell. 
Once she had sat down, the vice president took a deep breath and then looked back at the frazzled Sona Citri. With great seriousness, Subaki replies, Sona, if this is true, if you really feel this way, just know that you can count on me for support. Sona looked directly back at her very serious friend with great respect. Thank you, Subaki. I can't believe it myself. But, well, after what he did, in order to save Rias. The sacrifices he endured, Subaki, he is the one. I've never felt like this about anyone, ever. Subaki tilts her head questioningly. What about Rias, Erm, Ramori sama Sona takes a deep breath of her own while folding her fingers together on her desk. To be honest with you, Subaki, no, I don't think she actually loves him. Yes, she likes him. I am sure that's due to the pressure from her big brother along with the recent events involving Riser's defeat. So, she hangs off of him for now, acting like a girlfriend of sorts. Rewarding her faithful pawn, Hiyodo Ise is the Sekiryuti, the Red Dragon Emperor of Domination. Gramori sama got lucky to obtain such a piece. Subaki nods to herself. Sona stands up from her seat while taking off her glasses and placing them onto the desk. She then shows the slightest hint of agitation as she speaks. That's my point exactly. The way you just described Issei, that's how, they, look at him. I am sure of it. T.S. Buaki raises an eyebrow, and you don't, President. I mean, look at him like that. Sona shakes her head while now smiling warmly. No, Subaki, I don't. If you were to ask me a few weeks ago, if I would trade anything to get the Red Dragon Emperor into the House of Citri, my response would have been something akin to a simple, pass. Tsubaki raises her other eyebrow. Oh really? Sona nods while continuing her unusual smile. Before I was able to witness who Issei Hiyodo really is, I had my reservations about him. As it stands, I was fully convinced that if not for his sacred gear, Rias would want nothing to do with him. As for me, even with his gear, I still wanted little to do with him as his reputation alone was enough to make me feel sick to my stomach. Standing from her chair, Tsubaki makes her way toward the window and looks out while replying. So, you are saying that your reservations involving Hiyodo were wrong. You are saying there is another person, under this facade of perversion. I think I understand, President. As I said, I have your back in all of this. Just let me know when you want to make your move, I'll be ready. Walking toward the window next to Tsubaki was now Sona. Both girls were now looking out the window and toward Issei. It looked as though he had gone into some sort of sneezing fit as the girls surrounding him were all offering napkins. Scene 3 hours later, lunchtime in the ORC. Sitting at her own large desk was Rias Gramori. She was eating a large bento box along with a ceramic cup of hot tea. As she chewed her food silently, a small smile was adorning her plump lips. Kiba, Kaneko and Asia were sitting together on a couch only a few feet from the large desk. They all seemed to be enjoying their individual lunches while they carried on in small talk. Meanwhile, Issei was laying on another couch. He had his head resting on Akino's lap as she looked to be sucking on one of Issei's fingers. Closing his eyes tightly, the teen did the best he could not to get aroused by the moaning sounds of his senpai as she relentlessly used her tongue to gesture sexual hints as said tongue wrapped itself around said finger. Oddly enough, the rest of the peerage seemed to be ignoring this while continuing to enjoy their lunches. Finally, unable to take it anymore, Issei forced himself upward and off of Akino's lap while removing his finger from her mouth. Flustered as all hell, the teen did the best he could to spit out his words as carefully as he was able. Ak, ache, Akino san, erm. That's enough, I, I feel better now, hee hee. Tilting her head confusingly, Akino replies. Era era, Issei, darling kun, what's the matter? This isn't like you. Moving even further back from the black haired beauty, Issei hesitated for a moment before replying. Oh, it's just, well, erm, I don't think the president would want me to be in these kinds of positions anymore. R, right, president. Issei now turned his attention toward a now choking Rias. She was caught off guard by the sudden question and accidentally inhaled some of her food. After reaching for and drinking her hot tea, Rias casually replied. Ehim, Issei, what are you talking about? Why would I mind? Akino always consumes your excess energy. Why would today be any different? Issei thought deeply, 
Well, I did what her brother and Graphia wanted. I showed up to that party, gave my everything and not just my arm. I stopped that chicken from forcefully marrying Rius. Me, I did that. So, I must be more to her than just a pawn at this point, right? I mean, even Sirzex himself, even he was throwing me hints here and there. I know her family are always kind to their servants but even so, it's like I am being treated like actual family by the Grimoires. And now, ever since I saved Rius, she has been all over me. She has never held onto my arm before, not in public. No, it's a sign. She is testing me, she wants to see if I will continue in my perverted ways. Yeah, this is a test, it has to be. By refusing Akino's advances, I will be able to prove that I am no longer a perverted moron. Why haven't I thought of something like this before? It's full proof. Issei straightened himself while standing from the couch. This grabbed everyone's attention. Raising his head a bit, as to keep his bangs from intruding over his golden brown eyes, Issei spoke nervously. President Ramori, I just want you to know that I am loyal. Rias tilts her head and smiles nervously. That's nice, Issei. Thanks for that. Issei shakes his head rapidly. That's not what I mean. I meant, if you wanted to, I don't know, go steady or something, I just wanted to reinforce the fact that I would be loyal to you and nobody else. Instantly, the entire room went completely silent. Each member of the peerage now had extremely widened eyes along jaws completely agape. Issei stood where he was, however, after a few moments, his head began to lower as Rius's expression was that of something he wasn't expecting. She looked to be deep in thought, as if she were deciding what outfit she would wear for that day. Then, she smiled warmly. Issei was about to raise his head again, seeing the smile, that was until Rius began. Speaking, Issei, thank you so much for telling me your feelings. It means a lot, it really does. But you need to understand that I am not interested in getting with anyone right now. Now, that doesn't mean that I am not grateful for what you've done for me in my house, but, it. Before Rias was able to finish her sentence, Issei turned around and walked quickly toward the door. This was very uncharacteristic of the usual Issei Hyodo. Before another word or action could be conveyed, the loud slam of the front door made everyone in the room jump. Rias was about to protest, that was until Akino raised her voice. Rias, what the fuck? Rias's jaw was now agape as she stared back into her angry queen's purple eyes. Wah, this is your fault. First you dote on him, then you hog him from the rest of us. I won't even get started on how Sirzex and your mother have been trying to play matchmaker this entire time. Of course he feels all confused, poor soul. Akino now folds her arms while maintaining a soft scowl. Asia stands up while sobbing. No fair, no fair. Issei belongs to all of us. Kaneko sits back and rolls her eyes. Baka, Kiba sips his hot tea and closes his eyes. Not getting involved, sorry ladies. Chapter 2, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 2, Beware the Jabberwocky. Scene Kuo Academy, track and field yard, behind the school. A pair of large doors fly open, revealing a very agitated-looking Issei Hiyodo. With both hands in his pockets, his head was lowered in such a way that his eyes were not easily seen. This was of course because he was crying and didn't want to be caught doing so. As the lunch hour was nearly complete, the back area of the school looked to be deserted. This was what Issei was hoping for. He needed to be alone and process the recent moments without distraction. Raising his head just a bit, as to look where he was going, Issei stopped at a set of benches while proceeding to sit down in a slumped position. Placing his face in both of his open hands, Issei began to weep. So, it's true then. I am just a pawn to her. Damn, I feel so stupid. I should have said nothing. Why the hell did I open my fucking mouth? Now things are going to be shitty and awkward. This is what happens the moment I start to think, to think. Partner. Startled at first, Issei then relaxes back in his slumped position. Oh, you're awake, Dedrag. For the first time since we've been speaking, I can honestly say that I am proud of you. Sniffling a bit, Issei mentally replies. For what? Being a fucking simp. For confessing your feelings, for exposing your heart, these actions alone make me very proud of you. As his eyes begin to water up once again, 
Issei begins to use his shirt to wipe his tears away. Thanks for saying that, partner. But in the end, it doesn't really matter now, does it? She is a young devil, partner. I would give her time. Perhaps a bit of distance might do the two of you some good. Though, I am a dragon, so I might not be the best person to speak with involving romance. However, I am proud of you, nonetheless. Issei decides to lay completely down on his bench while looking up at the sky. Out loud, as a few stray tears make it down his cheeks, Issei speaks to Dedrake. Thank you, partner. Scene ORC. I don't see how it's any of your business as to who I am going to spend the rest of my life with. I just got out of a forced marriage. What makes you think I want to just jump into another? Rias looked absolutely cross as both of her hands were holding her waist. Meanwhile, Akino looked just as angry and immediately argued back. It becomes my business when you continuously and intentionally confuse our precious Kahai. Grow up, Rias. Rias's eyes went wide with rage. How dare you? I am far more mature than you are. At least I don't have daddy issues. Slap. Rias now has a hand over her cheek as Akino has her hand retracted. Akino then spoke very softly and matter-of-factly. Don't you ever talk about my father. I don't care who you think you are. The next time it's brought up, I will punish the ever-living hell out of you. Do you understand me, Rias Gramori? Before Rias could respond, Akino walked out of the room, leaving just Asia, Kaneko and Kiba. All of whom looked very worried. Rias then began to softly weep as she sank down into her chair. Scene, Student Council Office. President, I spotted Hyodo out in the back courtyard laying on some bleachers. He looks to be really upset about something. A blue-haired and full-figured Tsubasa Yura was breathing heavily. Sitting at her desk, Sona nods. Thank you for keeping an eye on him. Great job. Tsubasa bows while smiling brightly. Not a problem, President. I do have a question though. Sona lifts an eyebrow. Of course, what is it? Blushing a bit, Tsubasa speaks up. Well, is it really true? You know, about Hyodo. Sona looks at Tsubaki who simply returns a vacant nod. As if on cue, Tsubaki speaks up. Yes, Tsubasa, and everyone else who is listening. It's true. Instantly, the rest of Sona's peerage members, who were sitting around in furniture across the room while pretending to be busy doing homework, all turned their attention to their queen. Adjusting her glasses while straightening her blazer, Tsubaki continues. It goes without saying that what I am about to relay does not leave this room. With that, President C3 has indeed developed feelings for Hyodo Issei. As it stands, things might not be going very well involving Hyodo and President Grimori. Let's just say that I may or may not have overheard some negative interactions between the Red Dragon Emperor and his master. Tsubaki then pulls a hand-sized version of Mirror Alice from behind her back. At the same time, we hear a squeaking sound coming from near Tsubaki's feet. Panning downward, we notice an unremarkable and quite ugly-looking sewer rat. Instantly, everyone on the far corner, which included Momo Hinakai, a wavy white-haired girl with short bangs, Tomo Meguri, the auburn-headed girl with golden eyes, Rei Kusaka, who had warm and brown hair along with a very warm and motherly look to her matching eyes, and then finally, Genshiro Saji, an ash-blonde-haired boy with very blue eyes moved from their locations and lined up in front of Sona's desk. Once everyone was at attention, Tsubaki looked down at this rat-looking creature. Dormouse, begin playback from 20 minutes ago. Everyone in the room got very quiet as Sona began to sit back in her chair while taking a stressed yet very deep breath. Scene, Bleachers, behind Kuo Academy. Issei was started by the noise of the school bell which let students know they needed to return to their classes. Sitting upward, the teen blinked a few times while remembering his conversation with his best friend, Dedrag. Smiling sadly, Issei stood up while stretching. Deciding that skipping class might cause some issues with his parents, the overwhelmed teen took a large and dry gulp while proceeding with the rest of his school day. He did this while keeping to himself and not speaking to anyone unless he absolutely had to. This in itself gathered a great deal of attention as rumors of a depressed Issei flew around the school like wildfire. The pervert has gone emo now because he got kicked out of the occult research club. No, I heard he got his nuts removed by the kendo club and he hasn't been the same since. Well, that suits him just fine, call it divine justice. Haha, 
Yeah, karma. Right. Meanwhile, the orc were also avoiding contact with Issei as nobody knew what to say or do about the awkward situation involving the pawn's confession for Rias. So, things were left unsaid. Even the usual walk home was odd as the teen intentionally stayed behind after school, to ensure he didn't have to quietly walk with them, though they probably didn't want to, Issei thought. So, for now, Issei stepped foot into a place he never thought he would. The Kuo Academy Library, seen streets of Ku en route to the Hyodo residence. Akino, Kiba, Kaneko and Asia were all walking together while Rias was walking a few feet behind them. The overwhelming aura of doom was so intense that other people would avoid the group as they passed by. If one had Senjutsu, they would be able to actually see the dark cloud floating above the group. Nobody was talking as they all maintained a steady and brisk pace. Rias looked to be extremely downtrodden as her body posture was very sluggish. Scene, library, sitting at a desk, Issei was just staring off into nowhere. He wasn't reading a book or doing homework, rather, he was just there. As time went by, the team could see the sun setting from the large windows that overhang into fixed bookshelves. Deciding that he had spent enough time to avoid the peerage, Issei slowly picked up his things and began to make his way toward the exit. To his surprise however, none other than Sona Sitri and Tsubaki Shinra, both of whom were blocking the door as they stood side by side, were both looking directly back into his eyes. Seeing those two with their usual stoic attitudes, both of them blocking his way out, Issei was at a loss. Placing both of his hands above his head in a sarcastic fashion, Issei smiled nervously and spoke up. Oh, hello President Shitori and Vice President Shinra. What did I do this time? Sona looked at Tsubaki as Tsubaki looked back at Sona. Together they nodded. Now, the two looked back at Issei and each produced an odd and unearthly smile. Issei took a step back while feeling a slight hint of terror. Sona, while maintaining her forced, friendly, smile, spoke softly. Hyodo, would you please come with us back up to the student council office? Don't worry, you aren't in trouble if that's what you're thinking. Nodding. Tsubaki then spoke up. It's perfectly fine Hyodo, nothing to worry about. We honestly just wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one with you, that's all. It is the job of the student council to not only maintain discipline, but to also look after the welfare of each and every student. Issei looked at both girls while lowering his tired arms to his sides. Then, after blinking a few times, Issei nodded. All right, sure, I guess I can come with you guys. But you aren't messing with me right, I'm not really in trouble and you are just trying to get me to come along quietly for some punishment. Sona's smile now turns into her usual stoic attitude. Hiodo, Issei jumped at Sona's outburst. Yes, Sona adjusts her glasses and continues. Stop wasting time and please, just follow us, alright. As she finished her sentence, the smile returned, except this one looked like a real smile. For some reason, Issei couldn't argue with that smile. Gripping his backpack, Issei made his way along with Sona and Tsubaki down the halls and up to the student council office. The walk was silent however the air didn't seem so thick as it usually would have been for Issei during his past encounters with Sona. Scene, student council office. As the doors opened, Issei noticed that the room was occupied by the other members of the student council. He was familiar with the boy known as Saji who was currently waving back at him with a strange smile on his face. Next to Saji were the female majority of the council, he wasn't personally friends with any of them, rather he hardly knew them, aside from Saji. As far as the only male member of this club, Saji was more of a soft rival to Issei as the two would compete from time to time. Interestingly enough though, the other females were also smiling and waving at him. Their smiles were a bit worrying as they looked to be forced almost as if they had been sad earlier. Ignoring his feelings for now, Issei simply smiled and waved back. As Sona moved toward her desk, Tsubaki placed a hand lightly on Issei's shoulder as she directed him toward a pair of chairs in front of Sona's desk. Complying, the nervous teen sat down where he was instructed to while proceeding to take a deep breath. After sitting, the rest of the council also sat down in their respective chairs and couches. Sona then folds her fingers together on her desk while looking deeply into Issei's eyes. She has a very serious focus on her demeanor as her stoic features seem to intensify. Hyodo Issei, I have an important question to ask you. 
I expect nothing short of the truth. Do you understand me? Issei took a large gulp as his nervousness practically doubled. Erm, I thought you said I wasn't in trouble. Sona shakes her head slowly from right to left. Then she focuses back while looking deeply once again. You are not in trouble, not from me. But I need your honesty. Alright, Issei nods. Alright, President. Nodding back, Sona takes a small breath in and out. Issei, are you happy? Chapter 3, Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazzle. Chapter 3 Inches Magical Girl Adventures. Scene, Kuo Academy, Student Council Office. Everybody in the room now had their attention directed at Issei. Meanwhile, the teen felt as though he was in the hot seat. What was he supposed to say to such a question? Of course he wasn't happy, but what would be the point of telling Sona Sitri this? Issei was about to say something akin to, I don't know, however he was interrupted by the sounds of what seemed to be a teleportation circle behind him. Instantly everyone else in the room looked toward where the sound was coming from. Sure enough, in between the main doors and Sona's large desk, a large blue-colored circle had manifested itself onto the wooden floor. Issei turned his head not knowing who would come out from that portal. After a sudden blue flash, two individuals were standing in place of the now dissipated teleportation circle. Issei was able to recognize one of the two females. This was Ruruko Nomura, the first-year student who was also a member of the student council. She was a petite girl with long brown hair that was held in place by green hair clips. Along with her emerald green eyes, she had quite the look to her. The other girl standing next to her looked to be some model who was cosplaying as Milky Chan, one of Issei's favorite animes. She had twin-tailed black hair along with large and vibrant blue eyes. Her figure was on the shorter side however she was very well endowed. She was wearing a pink magical girl's outfit along with a matching hat and wand. As Issei was doing the best he could to hold his jaw from falling onto the floor, Sona's attitude changed 180 degrees as she now looked absolutely cross. No longer sitting, Sona was pointing angrily toward the two who just happened to appear in the room seconds ago. Then, the cosplayer ran from her position while proceeding to jump over Sona's desk only to tackle the flustered student council president in a bone-crushing hug. So Chan, oh how I have wanted to see you for such a long time. I've missed you so much. So Chan, so Chan. The cosplaying girl was screaming all of this out while crying fake tears as her smile was very infectious. Sona quite literally stiffened up as she slowly turned her head down toward the hugging, Milky Chan. Gaining a very large tick mark, Sona spoke up in a very no-nonsense type of way. Seraphal, what are you doing here? Sona then looked over at a still-standing Ruruko. And what were you doing with my sister, talking about things you shouldn't be I assume? Ruruko is smiling very nervously. Well, P, President, I can explain. You see, while still hugging her sister, the now-known Seraphal cries out the following, she wanted to have VIP tickets for the upcoming anime con in Tokyo. So I told her, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So, don't be too hard on her, sister. She is a good girl, yup yup. Sona taps her foot while massaging her right temple. Ruruko, what did Seraphal want in exchange for your, tickets? Ruruko looks very nervous now. She wanted me too. Seraphal began to laugh heartily while still holding onto her sister. Your pawn promised to tell me everything involving you. Daily reports for a month. It's a fair exchange if you ask me. Those con tickets are really hard to come by, even being me, they are still hard to find. Sona now looked as though she might explode. Meanwhile Issei began to tilt his head as he stared at the strange interaction between the two, sisters. Deciding that saying anything at this point will probably only make things worse, Issei thought it best to try and make an exit from the scene. Standing from his chair, Issei quickly bows and swiftly speaks up. So, it looks like you have some family matters, so I think I will just head back home, it's late and Issei stopped speaking the moment Seraphal turned her attention onto him. Now pushing Sona away from her, the black-haired cosplayer proceeded to jump over her sister's desk, once again only to grab the retreating teen into a death grip of a hug. And where does my Sachan's boyfriend think he is going? Seraphal was only inches from Issei's blushing and confused face. At first, Issei was at a loss for words. 
He was being hugged relentlessly by a beautiful woman who looked exactly like his idol but that wasn't all. No, she had said something that didn't make sense. Deciding to speak up as Seraphal looked to be waiting for some kind of reaction, Issei nervously smiled. Seraphal is it. So, you are Sona's sister. So, that makes you kind of like Sirzex. Before Seraphal could answer, Issei then widened his eyes and blurted out, Wait, what do you mean, Sona's boyfriend? The entire room looked to be in suspense as Issei began to turn his attention from Seraphal to a now very flustered Sona. For some reason, Issei then turned his attention to the other peerage members, specifically Saji. Looking at his fellow rival, Issei shrugged his shoulders as if asking for confirmation of his predicament. Smiling nervously back, Saji simply nodded. Instantly, Issei's head began to fog up which made him feel a bit dizzy. Issei's right arm began to pulse with a red glow. Citri Devils, I would like to apologize for what is about to happen. Everyone in the room jumped a bit from the sudden proclamation from Issei's sacred gear, the Drake. Before anything else could be done or said, the brown-haired teen's eyes rolled into the back of his head followed up with a sudden collapse. Seraphal was the first to notice as she found herself holding the limp body of a now overwhelmed and unconscious Issei. Uncharacteristically, Sona was the first person to react verbally. Issei, Seraphal, who was now pushing a large strand of hair from a sleeping Issei's face looked back at her sister. She then uses her index finger and places it toward her lips. Shish, Sachan, he's been through a lot in the past 24 hours. Don't worry, he is fine. Also, thank you for the warning, Dragon Sama. Issei's limp arm glowed once again. Just take care of my partner. He is going through things that I don't care to discuss. Seraphal giggles at this. Don't you worry, Mr. Dedrag, I already know everything. The Mao now turns her attention near the vice president's feet. She then winks at the sewer rat that Tsubaki calls, Dormouse. As agreed, here you go, little fella. Taking a small chunk of what looked to be cheese from her costume pocket, Seraphal proceeded to toss the piece toward Dormouse. Instantly the mangy rat began to munch away. Tsubaki looked shocked. Sona's expression looked to be a mix of rage and worry. Ruruko was hoping that Sona would forget about her deal with Seraphal. The rest of the peerage had a mixed set of emotions from concern to sad. This was probably due to them overhearing Issei's confession to Rias through Dormouse. Seraphal then lightly shook Issei. Wake up, Issei, Milky Chan has a present for you. Opening his eyes, Issei's foggy head began to clear. Though many questions were lingering in the young man's mind, he thought better to ask them at a later time. Standing on his own two feet again, Issei stopped leaning against the Mao, however she maintained her incredibly powerful grip on him. Sona seemed to have her attention now directly on Ruruko. Her angry demeanor changed into her usual stoic one. Ruruko, you have gone over my head. For that, you will be punished. Seraphal knew her little sister's wrath all too well. Because of this, she thought it might be a good idea to get Issei out of the room for now. Say, Issei, how about you show me around So-chan's school? I haven't had an opportunity to cruise the halls. It would make me feel like a little girl once again, to reminisce about my high school days. Issei didn't know what to say, however a quick nod from Tsubaki told him he'd better go with Seraphal as her look was oddly a worried one. Turning his attention back onto Seraphal, Issei smiled nervously and nodded. Sure thing, erm, Seraphal-sama. Ouch. Seraphal now had a childish grumpy look to her face. No no no, you call me Milky Chan. Issei, rubbing his sore forehead, was taken back. But I can't just call you that, I mean, yes, you look like Milky Chan, but. Seraphal stomped her foot down onto the hard wooden floor which made a loud cracking sound. I am Milky Chan, Issei. Yes I am also a Mao, but first and foremost, I am the magical girl, Milky Chan. And before you ask, yes, I do my own stunts. Issei's demeanor changed instantly from terrified expression, to that of a nervous fanboy. Seriously, Issei's outburst rattled most of the inhabitants of the student council office, all except Sona and a cowering Ruruko. So you are really her? The, Milky Chan? You aren't messing around, I am actually talking and well, hugging Milky Chan. Seraphal now nods proudly as she feels she has finally gotten her point across. The one and only, 
Issei now reaches for his backpack while pulling out a sheet of paper along with a pen. He then bows while presenting the writing items. Please, Ms. Milky Chan, would you sign your autograph for me? Matsuda and Motohama, not to mention, Aika, they will all go apeshit. Issei was now heaving in and out as his nose threatened to erupt with blood at any moment. This action made the Mao blush intensely. Issei, I didn't know you were my number one fan. Nodding very enthusiastically, the teen was so overjoyed that he forgot where he was, who was around him, even his previous fight with Rias, nothing mattered at the moment. Issei was star-struck. Seraphal then took hold of both pen and paper while placing both into one of her pockets. Smiling while winking, Seraphal spoke cutely. I'll sign this for you. Later. But only if I get a good tour of the school. Being my number one fan, as you say you are I am hoping you are going to make sure I have a good time while I'm here. Right, Issei-kun, nodding excitedly once again, Issei's smile made it look as though he was back to his old and perverted self. Yes, yes, you can count on me, Milky-chan. Onward, we will start our tour beginning with the Kendo Club locker room. Sona and Tsubaki both raise eyebrows as Seraphal looks very excited. Before Sona or Tsubaki could protest, Seraphal released all but Issei's hand as she then dragged him at insane speeds toward and out the main door. The room went very quiet all of a sudden. Slowly, Sona's gaze turned from the door and now toward Ruruko who met her master's gaze with sheer terror. Aside from the usual stoic Tsubaki, the rest of the peerage looked to all have various types of worried looks. Scene, Hyodo Residence. Rias was currently making the large bed in Issei's bedroom. As she was placing the final blanket on top, she took the time to notice the silence within the room itself. It wasn't just the fact that Issei wasn't currently inhabiting the room, no, it was also the fact that Rias was being shunned by her peerage. With that, the girls of the group decided they would bunk in their assigned rooms for the evening. Even while knowing that Issei was probably upset with her, Rias thought she could easily fix the situation with a few sweet words and skinship with her pawn. She thought maybe it wasn't a bad thing that the girls were mad at her, not really. At least tonight she would have some alone time with her precious pawn. Once the bed was fully made, Rias took a deep breath while looking at the bed stand alarm clock. According to the Yandere serial killer anime girl that was displayed on the monitor, half past 10 p.m. was highlighted in neon green. Deciding that this was far too late for Issei to be out, Rias proceeded to create a communication circle above her ear. Like teleportation circles, communication circles are the smaller counterparts that work as a telephone. In the case of the Grimori house, these circles were crimson in color with intricate markings symbolizing the house they represent. Rias was now sitting on the bed with her legs crossed. She had a mildly worried look to her face which began to intensify the longer she received no response from her circle. Now standing up, Rias' cheeks began to puff out in a childish way. Issei. Answer the damned communication. Chapter 4. Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 4. The Evening Date with Seraphal. Scene, Kuo Academy, Kuo Japan. The room was very dark at first, that was until Issei flipped the light switches. As the buzzing sound of neon bulbs filled the air, the teen lightly pulled his idol in and through the door with her very soft hand. Silver-colored lockers filled the room along with stone benches that followed along the corridor. Seraphal looked very impressed as Issei looked to be holding back his own drool. Then, turning around while using his spare arm to emphasize his meaning through a means of wavy gestures, Issei spoke up. Behold, Milky Chan, for this is the temple in which my friends consider to be hallowed ground. The Kendo Girl's Locker Room Seraphal then removes her hand from Issei's while proceeding to clap with very much enthusiasm. Wow, Issei number one fan Kun, I am so glad you are feeling better. You don't seem to be sad anymore. Yay, I am having so much fun, thank you for taking me on this tour. Reality hit Issei like a ton of bricks the moment a crimson-colored communication signal started to buzz relentlessly next to his ear. Issei's smile vanished instantly. Seraphal noticed this while reaching for one of his hands again. Scene, Hyodo Residence. Rias was now standing on top of the large bed while pacing in a bouncing motion back and forth. Her communication circle followed her left ear as Rias's lips were curled in anger. Answer it, you baka. Come on, 
Issei, I'm really sorry. Please answer. Rhea stops her pacing and plops down onto the bed the moment she hears confirmation of a connected call. Oh, thanks Satan he is answering, I have to make this right. Instantly, Rias pulled back from her circle the moment she heard a very loud and overly happy female voice, shrieking through the communication line. Rhea Tan, why hello, oh, right, we are in Japan, so, moshi moshi. To Rias's horror, she was able to recognize the voice of this woman. It was her best friend's sister, Seraphal Leviathan. Rias had many memories which involved Seraphal, as Rias would spend a great deal of time with Sona in their childhood days back in the underworld. Seraphal was like a big sister to both girls. Whenever they got into trouble, they would run to their Sarah Chan and she would spoil the two. Rias was dumbstruck at first but managed to shake it off. Straightening her posture, the Switch Princess speaks in a soft and calm voice, although she would very much like to scream at this point. Seraphal, why hello, it is very surprising that I would be speaking to you of all people, especially considering I was making an attempt to speak with my pawn. Scene Kendo Girls Locker Room Issei was now laying on one of the stone benches while staring at the ceiling. He had no particular look to his face, he just seemed to be there and nothing more. Meanwhile, Seraphal was pacing the room while holding Issei's communication circle with both her index finger and thumb. When she was speaking, she chose to rather yell into the thing, rather than just talk at a normal volume. Her mannerisms were very up and bubbly as she was twirling her heart-shaped scepter in her other hand. Oh boo, Rhea Tan, I thought you would be happy to hear from your favorite Sarah Chan. Well, to be honest with you, Sarah Fall's body posture changes immediately into something much sterner. The twirling of her scepter stops and she takes a deep breath. Her smile turns into a disgusted frown. Rias, Issei will be spending this evening in my care. Tomorrow he will be back at class. Now, if you would like to argue with me, then I suggest coming to your adorable school, where I will be happily waiting. Instantly, a loud noise could be heard from the top floor of the school. This caused Issei to sit up and tilt his head in wonder. Seraphal looked up and a small smirk came back to her face. The noise was so loud that even Rias could hear it from the other side of the call. Never, spank, go, spank, over, spank, my, spank, head, spank. This was followed up by the sounds of a girl screaming in pain. Ah, Issei began to shudder while laying back down on his back. Rias, from Issei's bedroom, was able to hear what sounded like somebody being tortured. Seraphal was thinking that the VIP tickets must have really been worth it for Ruruko, knowing full well how strict her little sister is. Seraphal then looked back at the circle in her fingers. Well, Rhea Tan, you don't have a problem with, Auntie, Sarah Chan watching over Issei for the night, right? Rias thought long and hard about this. She could complain to her brother, but then would get scolded for what she said to Issei especially since the arranged marriage involving herself and Issei was legitimized, as this was Rias's own request she would definitely get a serious reprimand. Also, she knew full well how powerful Seraphal actually was. There was a reason why she is single to this very day. Regardless, what was Seraphal doing? With her pawn, that was the question of the day, or rather night in this case. Deciding that she will drill Issei for information tomorrow at school, Rias relents. That's fine, Seraphal. Good night. Rias then cut the call. The blue-eyed Seraphal now looked back and toward a laying Issei. Well, that settles that. Come on, mister, you've got a tour to finish. Seeing that Issei was laying down, Seraphal then grins. P-L-O-P. Instantly, Issei feels pressure on his lap. Sitting up once again, Issei was surprised to see the giggling Seraphal Leviathan straddling his lap while looking directly back at him with those large and blue eyes. Issei blinked a few times and then showed a nervous smile. Yeah, okay, I suppose we could check out the atrium and some of the club rooms. Happy with his answer, Seraphal jumped off of the startled teen as she reached for his hand. Issei took a moment but chose to take hold of Mao's hand while leading her to other parts of the school. This went on for a while as Seraphal would take the time to ask questions about Issei's academic life. Issei noticed quickly that this woman had two sides to her. The first being the childlike side. The other was more complex as time went by throughout the evening. There was that one time, 
In the locker room, Issei could swear that Seraphal was clearly threatening Rias. But then there was now. She was asking questions that a grown-up would ask. Questions involving Issei's academics, his grades, his interests outside of school. Naturally, the team didn't have time to think about his problems back at his home. It was almost as if Seraphal herself, somehow she wouldn't allow any negativity to affect him. After about an hour and a half, Seraphal checked her pink phone and widened her eyes. By now, the couple were standing near the front main office of the school, next to the entrance doors. Seraphal then made a small, eek, sound. Issei looked back at the Mao. Seraphal looked back at Issei while shaking her head. Oh no, no no no. We were having such a good time that it got really late all of the sudden. Well, Issei, it was a lot of fun and I had a really great time. Thank you so much. Seraphal then suddenly kissed the confused teen on his forehead. Before Issei could respond, Seraphal then walked back a bit as she waved her scepter into the air. As blue energy began to whirl around the room, it slowly started to gather at a point near the ground which formed into a circle. As this was happening, Seraphal spoke up while smiling brightly. Issei, you are going to stay somewhere safe tonight. Don't worry, you will be in good hands, I promise. Issei protested. Serafa, Milky Chan, you don't have to inconvenience yourself. Seriously, I don't mind going home, I am sure it. Issei was cut off by Seraphal. I won't hear of it. You need at least one night's break from Rias. You know what they say, distance makes the heart grow fonder. Thinking to himself, Issei remembered what Dedrag had said earlier, back on the school roof. Aside from the poetic part of what Seraphal had said, the dragon practically said the same thing. Then a question came to mind. Milky Chan, where are you sending me? Issei was now tilting his head confusingly. Once the circle was completed, Seraphal simply skipped over toward Issei and with one hand, she pushed him into the circle while blowing a kiss goodbye as he vanished away. See you soon, number one fan. Blue flash. Scene unknown and dark location. Ouch. That hurt. Moments ago, Issei fell from Seraphal's teleportation circle that was placed on the dark room's ceiling for some reason. Realizing that he was laying on a hard surface, Issei attempted to get his footing only to be blinded by lights being turned on all of the sudden. As Issei was, unable to see anything, he was able to hear the following. Hyodo, why are you in our room? This was clearly Sona's frazzled voice. Freezing in place, Issei didn't know what to do, so he just kept his eyes tightly shut while throwing his arms up in panic once again. Then, another voice could be heard, it was Subaki this time. In her usual stoic demeanor, she declared the following, Oh, you're here, well, I suppose I'll go and heat up some tea. Oh no, you broke my bookshelf. Oh well, can't be helped. Please make yourself at home, Hyodo kun Issei lowers his arms and opens his eyes. After a few minutes Issei found himself sitting at a small table with Tsubaki and Sona. All three were sipping some hot tea. It was very quiet as nobody was talking. The flustered brown-haired teen was doing the best he could to look calm however he was pretty sure his attempt was failing. Finally, after another minute went by, Tsubaki looked at Issei as she tilted her head. Hyodo, I assume that Seraphal Sama didn't send you here along with a fresh uniform for class tomorrow. Tsubaki then adjusted her glasses as she focused on Issei's clothing. Sona then nodded matter-of-factly. Indeed, as late as it happens to be right now, Issei, go into our bathroom and take a bath. You can leave your dirty clothes outside. Tsubaki and I can get them run through the washing machine so that you will have something clean to wear in the morning. Tsubaki then stands up and moves to her closet. Opening the door, she looks through some clothes. Pulling out a large and pink sleeping gown, Tsubaki nods. This will fit you I am sure. Issei shakes his head repeatedly while showing a look of terror. No way, Ern, Vice President. I can't wear, you know, your clothes. It wouldn't be right on so many counts. Besides, if anyone found out. Sona then cleared her throat. So, you would prefer to sleep here naked then. Tsubaki now stared down at the nervous Issei. You will wear this. Now. Go to the bathroom. Issei takes a large and hard gulp. Meanwhile, the drag was laughing hysterically in the back of Issei's mind. H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A, 
you'd better do it partner, they look serious. Ha 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 ha, don't worry, I won't say a peep about this, pfftha. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.